All right, everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's get going. Um, uh, thanks for showing up, everybody. So uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, my, I used to say old friend, but then Mike wouldn't get a friend. I found some of the older professors get angry when you say old friend. So I'll say my longtime friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Dawson, um, who is currently a professor at UC Merced. Um, most of you guys know about UC Merced. They started just about the same time we started. And so I came here and Mike went there and, and a couple other friends of mine went to UC Merced and uh, had a lot of the same experiences we have had, starting very small, um, you know, not, not a lot of infrastructure and kind of grow, growing as we teach and as we do research. So um, after the talk, another great thing might be if you guys were curious as to how things are evolving on their campus, they have, a, you say 6,000? Yeah, six, six and a half thousand. Six and a half thousand. So, Right, so um, a little bit more than us, but, but fairly grossly similar uh, in terms of the, the growth rate of stuff. So a lot of our challenges are the same challenges. A lot of our great things are the same great things that those guys have going on. So um, we can talk about that later. But Mike's here to talk to us about his uh, really, really a fascinating research. So Mike came to uh, graduate school at UCLA, uh, where I was, and was interested in doing um, marine ecology stuff. And in particular, we had a... Uh, a um, older professor, <laughs> to do this a lot, um, and was uh, one of the world's leading experts on plankton and gelatinous zooplankton and those kinds of things. And so Mike uh, entered his lab, his name was Bill Hamner, and uh, Mike rapidly started getting into all kinds of interesting uh, questions surrounding jellyfish. And uh, Bill Hamner at the time was, was, was working in um, one of these places that Mike will tell us about, Palau, and all the really interesting, um, neat ecology that was going on there. And, and Bill primarily was interested in documenting the species and what was this and the ecology. And Mike saw that and said, wow, there's a really neat, interesting evolutionary system going on here, uh, almost like a, a bunch of little microcosm, not almost, a bunch of little cool little microcosms, wonderful for experimental manipulation and all that kind of great stuff. He'll tell us about that. Um, and since then, Mike has expanded into to doing a whole bunch of other kind of cool stuff, all broadly related to, to evolution of our marine communities and how things have changed over time and how they uh, might change in the future. And so he leads a, an international team trying to, to re, redo the taxonomy of some of these gelatinous zooplankton. He's worked on endangered fish here in our estuaries along the California coast and just all points in between. Um, and so with that as an introduction, uh, what are you, you're going to tell us about what? Island-like marine environments and marine lakes or something. I am. Okay, right. So Mike Dawson. Thanks, John. So when you are old friends, you <laughs> get to accumulate a lot of stuff. So, so um, thanks so much for the uh, nice introduction, Sean. And as Sean said, you know, UC Merced and um, Cal State Channel Lines share a lot in common. So it's always a great pleasure to visit and see how the campus here is growing. And I heard you guys just went through your re reaffirmation of accreditation. Uh, in the You're middle, in the middle of it. We just finished our, our in-person visit, yeah. All right, cool. I'm sure it's going fabulous. <laughs> it's fantastic. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you um, about this work that I started as a graduate student at UCLA. So I started in the mid-1990s and basically have just been accumulating little projects um, along the way. Um, we've done a lot of work and um, as you guys will know, most science doesn't get done alone these days. And so these are our many collaborators. Um, there are, this is um, Professor Herm, <laughs> Bill Hamner. Um, Peggy Hamner, who's like um, his better half, many people say, <laughs> but they're both great. And then um, a bunch of taxonomists who are interested in marine invertebrates, essentially, have helped us describe and, and identify species that we'll work with. Um, we have a lot of co colleagues in Palau and in Indonesia who've um, facilitated the research in those um, places. And then currently we're working with a team from um, Australia and in Palau. Um, to look at some of the paleo ecology. So we've started with the modern um, ecology of the lakes. Um, we started to look at evolutionary questions. We're now trying to understand the paleo ecology to understand how the modern evolutionary patterns have, have arisen. So this is the kind of work that I'm going to tell you about today. The general idea for the talk, I guess we'd like, like 40 minutes or so? Sure. Okay. So the general idea of the talk is this. Right? So I'll start out with a little bit of of an introduction about the place of marine studies in island biogeography. Right, so you guys are thinking a lot about islands um, this semester. So I'll, and probably you don't run a lot across a lot of um, really detailed information on um, like ecological theory, um, 
on islands, particularly island biogeography theory. And I'll, t I'll explain a little bit why that is. And then I'll try to put our, the work that we're doing in these marine lakes in that context. So then I'll give a little bit of background to the marine, la to the marine lakes, um, tell you about some of the modern patterns that we've observed over the last 15 years or so, and then tell you kind of the preliminary stages of the um, paleoecological work that we're doing now, and try to make some sense of that in the modern lake. Um, if you have any questions at any time, don't hesitate to stop me. I'm happy to um, slow down and ask some questions so that you understand um, the information as we go through. Um, if you want to sit in silence, that's also fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And we'll just see how far we get. All right, so let's start off with this brief introduction to um, marine lakes. So if you do um, a, a web of science search for um, island biogeography, and um, then separate out that, that, uh, the results of that search um, according to terrestrial studies, freshwater studies, and marine studies, and then plot the number of papers that have been published through time. Since essentially um, 1968, when there was um, a really influential book published by um, E.O. Wilson and Robert MacArthur, this is what it looks like. So the number of publications per year is in green um, for terrestrial systems. The number of publications on island biogeography in freshwater systems is shown in light blue. So you can see these um, bars a little bit around here. And the number of publications per year on marine systems is shown in dark blue. So you can see that um, essentially since MacArthur and Wilson published their book in 1967 on the theory of island biogeography, it's been hugely influential in terrestrial systems, helping us understand um, why there are a certain number of species on islands of different sizes and islands that are different distances from the mainland. And yet it's had almost no influence on marine studies at all right, for the vast majority of that period of time. They've started to bubble up recently. So why is that? It basically dates back um, probably over half um, a century about our like, general perceptions of what terrestrial systems are like and marine systems are like. And it's encapsulated in this quote from a fam um, like really influential paper by Ernst Mayer in 1954, thinking about patterns of evolution in marine systems. And he starts it off with this quote, that since the ecology of marine organisms is fundamentally different from terrestrial systems, one might expect very different patterns of ecology and of evolution. And this has been really a, then a common theme for many, many decades. And so there's a paper here by Alistair Hardy, who is an influential um, English marine um, scientist, saying that the difficulty of studying the ocean is that it's a vast and hidden world. It's very dynamic, and it's very, very different from terrestrial systems. And so the general idea has been that the kinds of um, theory that explains patterns of diversity in terrestrial systems doesn't really work for marine systems. And that's a common, common theme in um, marine ecology. And so there's another quote, quote here from Mark Carr, who's currently a professor up at Santa Cruz. And he says again that you know, there are fundamental differences between marine and terrestrial systems in the scales of spatial um, and ev evolutionary processes. And yet if you chat with evolutionary biologists, right, <laughs> they'll tell you that there are five mechanisms of evolution and that they apply to all organisms, whether they live in freshwater, terrestrial, or marine systems. And they're essentially um, you know, listed here in these um, figures. So um, genetic drift, mutation, natural selection, um, and uh, populate, and what am I missing? Drift selection. Sexual okay. selection. Sexual selection will do. And gene flow. And gene flow, migration. That'll do. All right. <clears throat> OK, so um, and the general idea is that these are the three um, main processes, evolution processes that structure patterns of diversity in the species richness across the planet. And these apply in both marine and terrestrial systems, right? So we, there's kind of this incongruous idea that marine systems are very different, and yet they have to be explained by the same evolutionary systems, and the same evolutionary mechanisms. All right, and particularly people think about marine and terrestrial systems being very, very different in terms of um, patterns of migration, right? In that, um, Oceans are open, they have very high dispersal populations in, in great distances apart, are very well connected, and that that's in general thought to be not the same for terrestrial systems. Much smaller scale, less gene flow, more local adaptation. 
And yet the truth is that um, there is a great heterogeneity in patterns of dispersal on terrestrial systems and in, fresh, in, in marine systems. Right? And this is uh, referred to in studies then by Gunnar Thorsen as far back as the early 1950s, um, by Andrew Bohanek um, in a really um, nice review paper in 1999. And so it leads to these questions then, well, is there or is there not some kind of like general patterns, general theory that um, link marine and terrestrial systems? MacArthur and Wilson, and, and their book in 1967 on island biogeography, and Alfred Russell Wallace as, back as far back as 1881, would say that there are general patterns, right? and that a great place to study these general patterns are in islands, because they are small, discrete units that are really easy to study, they're small microcosms or mesocosms, as Sean mentioned. Right? And islands look like this. <laughs> right? They come in lots and lots of different shapes and sizes. So your classic island or your true islands like Hawaii, right? but you also get islands that are lakes. Right? So this is fresh, high altitude freshwater lake. And you get um, sky islands or tapui, which are at the very tops, high altitude tops of mountains. You get the tops of sea mounts and goyos, goyots in um, the ocean. And you get fumaroles in um, hydrothermally active terrestrial systems, and you get black smokers and uh, similar things in hydrothermally active uh, marine systems. And then you get your classic islands like this. Right? And then look inside here, there are also more lakes. So all of these things share this common kind of um, attribute of islands of being a piece of something, right? whether that's sea, um, land or water, entirely surrounded by a different habitat water or land, respectively. And when you think about them in more detail, right, if we go look at the coast of Hawaii, it's really obvious that there's, um, you know, there are benthic organisms that are marine here and only like tens of meters away. There are terrestrial organisms living here. And if you think about how far it is from uh, the terrestrials um, or the reef here, to the next, to the terrestrial and reef um, environments on the next island, they're almost exactly the same distance. Right? So there's this really nice um, way to compare um, patterns of marine and terrestrial diversity in islands because they essentially have exactly the same geometry right, around the periphery of islands. And so this is, becomes important because the way the patterns of diversity on islands are described by MacArthur and Wilson and um, a lot of the um, island biogeography literature since is in terms of the diversity of species on islands of different sizes and different distances from the, from the mainland, right? from essentially the source of um, colonist species. The general idea being that on big islands, you'll have more species, right? because there's essentially more space, more habitat for different species to live. And that on um, distant islands, you'll have um, fewer species because it's simply harder for species to get um, to colonize over a long distance than over a short distance. Right? So, Near big islands will have most species, distant small islands would have the fewest species. Right? And this is theory that's been, been de um, developed almost entirely in terrestrial systems. But as I mentioned, it's pretty easy these days now to go find um, marine systems that have these same kinds of qualities. Right? Is that there's an island of seawater here that's some distance from um, the ocean, and these hypothetically represent islands, and so we can ask whether the same kinds of theories um, pertain to the marine systems to, as to the terrestrial islands, and so ask whether these kind of these general patterns, whether these common evolutionary processes really do structure marine and terrestrial systems in similar ways. Not necessarily the same ways, um, but in similar ways. And so I'm going to tell you mostly of, um, today about our work in Palau. They mentioned this we've been doing it for about 20 years. Um, and so I'll basically just describe the development of that a little bit. Right? And we're going to be working in a bunch of these different lakes throughout the archipelago. Palau is um, in the Western Pacific, um, probably about a day's flying and traveling. The next section then is going to be a little bit of background on these marine lakes. It's really important to understand how the marine lakes form so that we can understand how the patterns of diversity in the lakes have accumulated. This is a map that shows the distribu geographic distribution of where we can find marine lakes at the moment, to the best of our knowledge. <clears throat> so this is Palau, right? If you go all the way across the Pacific, past Hawaii, to California, that's how far it is, right? So it's um, basically it's a full day flying, probably about 8,000, 10,000 kilometers. 
And th these are the best known marine lakes, and there are probably about 55 marine lakes there. There are also probably uh, 50, about 50 lakes in New Guinea, 50 in Vietnam, and then ten, fives to tens of lakes in various other places around the world. Unfortunately, none of the, these have been investigated. Right? So we've been working in Palau, and these are essentially the only lakes that have really been studied in, in any detail. And so these are the areas that we've been studying so far. I'll tell you about the lakes in Palau. Okay, so let's think about the physical diversity of lakes and how that arose, and then we can think about how the physical diversity affects the biological diversity from the lakes. So you all know that you know the, the modern world is changing right, in terms of climate, sea level rise, etc., and that these are particularly accelerated patterns that we've seen throughout the history of the Earth. And so if we think about the Earth, um, and so this is what cloud looks like in the modern day, Right, with these um, marine lakes and the islands surrounded by land. And marine lakes come in a variety of different shapes and sizes. But 18,000 years ago, Palau would have looked essentially like one big um, terrestrial island. Right? There were no marine lakes 20,000 years ago. Um, at the last glacial maximum, when sea level was about 120 meters lower than it is today. But the islands of Palau are uplifted um, Miocene reef. So it's essentially calcium carbonate, right? It's karst, and so it's has many fissures and tunnels in it. It's very porous. And so as climate warmed after less glacial maximum, the glaciers and the ice caps started to melt and flow into the seas and sea level would rise. Then the, as sea level rose, it would start to flood through the fissures, through this porous karst, and start to flood into any low-lying valleys, right? And this would start to form um, early marine lakes. And at the very start, they're very um, shallow, right? And they have um, new, they have or, they're populated by organisms that are brought by the flood water from the surrounding ocean into the lakes. And so they have organisms that are very, very similar to, but a subset of the lake, of the ocean um, biota. Right? This is kind of the hypothesis about how this should, we think this should work. As climate continues to warm, sea level, um, glaciers, ice caps continue to melt, sea level continues to rise, the depth of lakes continues to rise, we maybe have more organisms that are introduced, but also um, the relative volume of um, new water that's added into a lake will decrease, and so it's possible that the rate of introduction of new species will decrease through time. And it's also possible that the characteristics of the lakes might change. Right? They tend to be brackish now, whereas when they were shallow, they must have been full seawater, so they become diluted through time. And then um, as sea level continues to rise, sh um, higher valleys will start to become flooded, and the whole cycle is essentially repeated in those new lakes too. So in the big picture, then, we have a series of lakes of different depths, right? And we estimate that those are different ages, with shallower lakes being younger than deeper lakes, deeper lakes being the oldest. And we started to do some um, radiocarbon dating on the sediments and the shells from the very bottoms of um, um, the lakes of the deepest depths, and we start f and we get estimates that match um, predictions of the ages of lakes based on the rate of sea level rise. So the lakes if, from which we have taken sediments um, at the moment, at the moment from the bottom of the lakes and done the radiocarbon dates, come out at around um, eight thousand years um, old. Right, so these lakes started to form maybe around fifteen thousand years, ten thousand years before present, and they've been. Um, the communities have been assembling and evolving since then. The other important thing to know about the modern lakes is that because there are, there are different ages, there are different shapes, and there are different sizes, that they um, do have these different physical characteristics. So this would be um, a young lake. It's about four meters deep. It's about 100 meters in diameter. And if you look at the water column at each um, meter depth, you would find that it essentially has the same temperature, the same salinity, and the same um, oxygen at every layer in the lake, right? So it's well mixed. Um, deeper lakes start to um, basically de uh, decrease in temperature and um, increase in salinity towards the bottom, right? And this is uh, essentially because they become diluted with um, rainwater at the top. Salty water is heavier than um, fresh water, right? So they um, maintain, they stay high salinity towards the bottom. And this causes stratification because of density. And that means that oxygen um, 
dissolves into the water at the top, but it's used up by the organisms that live in the lake, and so you end up with decreased oxygen concentrations with it towards death. So this obviously is going to affect the way that the kinds of organisms that can live in the lake. In the deepest lakes, you find that and you have this kind of um, stratification in salinity, temperature, and oxygen in, in the upper waters, and then the bottom half of the lake is completely anoxic. Right? There's no oxygen there. It's really high in hydrogen sulfide, and it would be toxic for any um, multicellular organisms. So you find that the animals only live in the top half of the lakes. And so the lakes look a little bit like this. Right? All of the interesting marine life is in the top. Well, all the metazoan <laughs> marine life is in the top. Um, there are also lots of microbes there, but then you also find like anoxic um, anaerobes in the bottom of the waters too. Right? And that would be kind of important. OK, so this is kind of the general setup. So we're interested in then how these patterns, these different physical differences between lakes that arose through time have affected the organisms that live in them. An important part of this is if you think about how those lakes are flooded, right? They were all flooded from the ocean into the lake, and so they all formed independently of each other, and so they're like separate little test tubes, little ecological and evolutionary experiments that are each independent mesocosms. So that we have essentially experiments that have been running for somewhere like 15,000, 10,000 years. And we can now study those. So this is like a really super cool system. Okay, so what kinds of patterns do we see in modern marine lakes? The way that I'm going to set this up is remember that we have this um, essentially, what now, um, for 50 years almost of... Um, 50 years of studies from terrestrial systems that describe patterns of species diversity related to island size, patterns of species diversity related to the distance from the mainland, patterns of diversity um, related to how old islands are. And all of this has been developed in terrestrial systems. And so one way to ask whether there are general patterns would just be to take the predictions from terrestrial theory and apply them to these marine lakes and ask whether we find patterns that are consistent with the theory. If we do, then it suggests that that terrestrial theory applies to marine systems. If not, then it suggests that maybe there are some um, quite important differences. So what I'm going to do is just step through each of these hypotheses in time and show you some data that we've collected from marine lakes that are pertinent to these um, hypotheses. Let me just explain each of these briefly, so in case you're not familiar with them. So there's a set of four um, evolutionary hypotheses. So they referred to these as Wallachian, so referring to Alfred Russell Wallace, who really came up with um, the first thoughts about how diversity on islands evolved in 1881. And then a set of MacArthur Wilson um, perspectives, these are ecological theories from this 1967 book. So the first one here is peripatric speciation in punctuated equilibrium. This is an idea that if you have a small population on an island, it will evolve very, very rapidly. Okay? So rapidly that when you try to look back through a fossil record, you can't see it change. And so it looks like there's been a complete and very sudden shift from one kind of morphology, one kind of appearance, to another kind of appearance. <coughs> right? So it's a punctuated pattern. This is referred to as peripatry and punctuated equilibrium. Okay. The second one is the island rule. This suggests that the size evolution in organisms that um, inhabit islands so if you have a large mainland an ancestor and it colonizes a, an island, it evolves to small size, is one prediction. Okay. Um, we expect that um, to find, because predators generally are bigger than the prey that they feed on, we expect to find more prey species on islands and fewer predator species on islands. So we actually expect there to be a re reduced pre predation on islands than on the mainland. So we might expect to see evolution of characteristics that are related to predation or antepredation. Um, and we expect to see that you know, if, a, if a species manages to make it to an island, um, for that population to persist, it can't leave the island. So there are some ideas that you will see um, reduced dispersal ability in the island populations. The classic examples are birds. Right? So if a bird happens to fly to an island because it's basically flown up to um, fly somewhere on the mainland, a big storm um, sweeps in, blows it offshore, and it lands on an island, it manages to survive, the population can only persist if it doesn't get blown off the island somewhere else, right? So the idea is that birds will become less motile, they may become less, they may become flightless, and the same will happen to insects. So this reduced um, movement, ability to move. Okay. 
And then, um, those, so those are the evolutionary hypotheses. And then in terms of the ecological hypotheses, there are these kind of generally well-known patterns right, that I described earlier. You'll find fewer species on distant islands than on near islands. And you'll find um, more species on big islands than on small islands. And then, most recently, these have been put into um, what's being referred to as a general dynamic perspective, which is thinking about islands as actually places that change themselves. Right? And I'll come back to that in another way. Okay, so this pattern of peripatric speciation and punctuated equilibrium, just really very rapid evolution on islands. This is a phylogeny. <coughs> this shows the relationships of jellyfishes in marine lakes to jellyfishes elsewhere throughout the Indo-West Pacific. Right? So from Indonesia, Australia, Japan, um, add into um, Christmas Island in the Pacific. And these are what the animals look like all over the Pacific. Okay? And so if you can imagine what the ancestors looked like down here, they probably looked like this too. And this is what the jellyfishes look like in the um, sea around Palau. But if you look at the jellyfishes in the lakes in Palau, they look like this, right? So they've changed very rapidly. Remember that um, this is essentially a period of um, about three million years from this ancestor to these modern day populations. And this is remember, about 10,000 years. So they've changed radically in just 10,000 years on these lakes. So this seems to be consistent with this idea about very rapid evolution, punctuated equilibrium um, in um, island populations. Um, these are some genetic data. I won't go into detail. Explaining it's very pretty. It is very pretty. <laughs> it's very, very colorful. But they're also confusing to read, it turns out. So these basically data are basically just cons cons uh, consistent with the idea that um, the ocean populations are ancestral, the lake populations are derived. Okay. We have the geological hypothesis that suggests this should be true. The genetic data shows this too. And you can think about this in a way as the ocean populations being in blues and browns here, and then giving rise to lake populations at the periphery, right? And these are the lake populations at the periphery. Okay, what about the second um, rule, this island rule about evolution in size? These are, the, um, these are jellyfishes from Palau, from the ocean, and then from lakes, and they're um, drawn to scale. And so you can see again that this seems to be consistent with the pattern that we see from islands. Is that the um, ancestral ocean mainland populations are essentially very large and they decrease in size in um, isolated lakes. And in fact, these um, are put in order of the age of the lakes. So this is the youngest lake, this is the oldest lake. So you can see they actually become more different through time. These data also potentially speak to this um, idea that there should be reduced um, anti-predatory devices in island populations. So um, the ocean populations, we've seen them being eaten by turtles and being eaten by fishes. And there are ideas that the blue coloration, the spots, are essentially cryptic um, discoloration. So it makes them a little bit harder to see when they're swimming around in the surface waters of the ocean. And people have hypothesized that these long clubs at the bottom kind of act like um, lizard tails and can be autotomized or dropped off if they're being um, harassed by a predator. And you can see that in all cases, right, those things are lost gradually or lost in the island, in the lake populations. So this is again with idea, consistent with the idea from terrestrial theory that you lose antipredatory devices um, when you're not exposed to predators on, um, in marine lakes. And these are some data for snails, just to show that it's not just the jellyfish. Because <laughs> right. so, we love jellyfish. We love jellyfish. Right? But most people love mollusks. Snails are awesome. Yes, yeah, snails are also awesome. As are fishes. And I have some True. fish Thank data for the ichthyologists <laughs> later on. Okay. So um, this is essentially just a graph on the right that shows um, the width of a shell versus the height of a shell. And so the width and the height of the shell grow in proportion, okay, is all that shows. If you look at the shell thickness versus the shell height, and you um, basically plot ocean populations in blue and lake populations in green, you can see that the lake snails have thinner shells than um, ocean snails, right, for a given size. So they actually have proportionally um, thinner shells. 
And if you look at the amount of damage on shells that, is in, that indicates the level of predation, this is plotted here for um, ocean populations and for lake populations. And in general, you can see that there's less predation on um, lake snails than on ocean snails. So this is consistent with there being reduced anti-predatory devices, right? It's easier, it's, um, easier to break a thinner shell. So that's reduced anti-predatory devices in these populations in islands that have less predation. Okay, so again, consistent with the predictions from island theory. And then if we think about these, you know, the evolution of flightless birds and the evolution of flightless insects and ask whether um, organisms that live in the lakes are also less mobile, we again find that there's support for this. This is a graph that shows the swimming speed of jellyfishes versus um, the, le the place they've been um, collected from. This is an ocean population. This is a young lake. It's the, that sh shallow lake that I showed um, several slides ago. And then these are the older deeper lakes, again, plotted in order of age and depth. And you can see that um, jellyfish swim fastest or most mobile in ocean, in ocean populations and least mobile in the oldest lake populations. So again, they're losing the ability to move in these islands on these islands. So all of these evolutionary hypotheses are consistent with the predictions that have been made from terrestrial systems. So that's kind of cool, right? Okay, what about the ecological theories from MacArthur and Wilson? These are um, data that we've collected with um, our collaborators. Mike Beeman has been, um, as you've seen, said, is working on microbial diversity. Um, Rob Meyer, um, who's an amateur ecologist, has, worked, has done a huge amount of work in plow and fishes, so these data we've collected with him. Um, we've collected data on the invertebrates, and then our colleague, Harvick Stiebor from Munich in Germany, um, has collected data on phytoplankton. And so these curves are the best fit um, data to um, each of the data for the, each of these different taxa. We have species diversity on the y-axis. It's for the invertebrate species and phytoplankton over here, and for the microbes here on the left, right. And then um, the distance of the lake from the source population in the ocean on um, the x-axis. And so in every single case, you can see it's um, the further and further an island, the further and further a lake is from the mainland, from the ocean, the fewer and fewer species you have on it. Right? So again, consistent with theory. That's cool. This is super cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the terrestrial bio island biogeographers love this, right? Because everybody's told them forever that, oh, marine systems are different. And you know, your theories that you care so much about in terrestrial systems <laughs> don't apply. And so when you tell them, oh, they do, they're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And so then this is the species area relationship, right? Super famous relationship. Um, we've plotted it as a log log re, um, relationship so that you can plot a linear um, regression, so a linear fit. And these are the patterns that you get for the microbes, for the invertebrates, fishes, and phytoplankton. And so for the most part, right? And so actually, the other part of this is that um, the dark lines are for the well mixed lake. Mm -hmm. right? So these ones that are the same temperature, salinity, oxygen at all depths. And the light lines are the ones for the stratified lakes that differ. Um, so you can see that for the most part, um, you have um, more species on bigger in bigger lakes, okay. i.e. the slope of the line um, goes up from left, bottom left to top right. But it's not always the case, right? Is that the phytoplankton are decreasing um, in abundance in these um, well mixed lakes? So there's some other stuff going on too. So that starts to play into the modern conception of island biogeography and the kind of studies that are going on now. So for 40 years, um, studies of islands have really been um, based in this theory that MacArthur and Wilson came up with in 1967. And over the last dec or decade or so, that started to transition to this system where we're thinking about islands as things that change themselves through time. Right? So as the lake started off small and shallow and become deeper and larger, the same kinds of parallels happen in um, terrestrial islands, and I'll talk about this in a moment. Right, so the idea that there are other things that are going on. So if you look at, say, the productivity of different lakes, there's a relationship between productivity and species diversity and phytoplankton. And so there are just, there's other information going on. Okay. So this idea about the fact that the physical environments of lakes, of um, islands, changes through time. This is referred to now as the general dynamic theory. It started to appear in the literature about um, 2000 and has been encapsulated by um, Rob Whisker and colleagues in a paper in 2008. And the basic idea here is 
<clears throat> and you can imagine Hawaii being a little bit like this, right? Is that um, the lakes, they start off small as they flooded, and then the water increases in depth, they become bigger. For volcanic islands, they don't exist until the volcano erupts above the surface of the sea, right? And then they generally increase and become bigger through time. And then after the volcano becomes extinct, the island erodes and decreases in size and disappears down into the sea ultimately. Right? So you'll be familiar with Hawaii, that essentially the youngest island um, is actually a tiny little speck um, south of Hawaii. And the second youngest island is the big island of Hawaii. And then essentially as you get further north, the islands get generally smaller in size. And you get into Palmyra and the atolls and then um, the old sea mass um, um, disappear under the ocean surface. So the idea is that over the lifetime of um, an island, whether it's a lake or treasure systems, they first grow in size and then decrease in size. And that means that as they grow in size, there's more space for species to live. So you can have more species on them. And as they start to decrease in size and erode, then the species diversity decreases through time too. Right. So the, the physical changes in the um, islands and the biological changes in the islands are somehow very closely tied together. Um, just for fun, because um, we have these data, and um, I was giving a talk where um, Rob Whitaker was like the host, I thought I'd plot the data, and these are our data, and essentially there's no relationship to what's <laughs> like this, right? Except for maybe the microbes, but the scatter on the microbe plots are all over the place. So for the lakes, we don't find any this pattern, right? But it's probably because when you think about Hawaii, right, this, these are millions and millions of years old islands. Whereas the lakes are just tens of thousand, you know, ten thousand years most. So it's probably something that the lakes are really just down at this part of the curve. Okay. That right. spells respectful to him. <laughs> Give him a way out. He still talks to me, so it works. <laughs> okay. So these are the modern patterns. So we're interested now in how did they really arise? And so we've speculated about changes in size of the lakes, changes in the physical environment. But um, because anything that lives in the surface of a lake, right, when it dies, it's going to fall onto the bottom, there should be a, a record of sediment at the bottom of the lake that actually just captures the different stages in the development of lakes, in the ev evolution of lakes. So I mentioned earlier on that we caught to the bottom of some of the lakes and we have some sediment from essentially the very bottom reaches of lakes. And those can be dated at 10,000 years or so before present. And so we are now starting to try to think about collecting pieces of sediment from different depths um, underneath the lake and to try to find out what kinds of organisms are there, what, kind of, what the systems look like at that time in the past. To try to understand that, we're also trying to work out more about what goes on in the lakes at the modern day. Right? How do um, populations change in abundance relative to changes in temperature or oxygen or uh, salinity of the water? How does that relate to climate? Right? What can the modern patterns tell us about past um, changes in the past in these lakes? So we're essentially trying to measure everything that we can in the lakes. So we've started to put a lot of instruments around the lakes. So these are weather stations that we've installed and are maintained monthly by um, our colleagues who live and work in the lab. We're collecting um, information on the salinity and the movement of the water, whether that's in the body of the lake or whether it's in tunnels that come into the lake. We're collecting um, temperature and light and um, water level data and a host, whole host of other things in about 20 lakes at the moment. We started to do surveys of um, all of the organisms that live on the sides of the lake, so the sponges, the ascidians, um, the algae. So we're essentially now like real, you'll be proud of me, yeah. like real classic yes. marine ecologists. Like yes. We're doing transects and quad rats, <laughs> and it's awesome. And so we dive, we lay a transect out, and we have like a little horizontal line that has four sample points on it. And we just work up at um, regular intervals from the bottom of the lake to the surface of the lake. And we collect whatever's underneath these little circles. And we do this in, um, in and we do this probably 10, 15 times in each lake, so we'll end up with a 1,000 data points on the organisms that are there. And we're going to try to barcode them um, later on to find out all kinds of species diversity, different types of genetic diversity. And then we're also taking these cores from the lakes. And so this involves basically carrying in like huge amounts of equipment, setting it up on a raft in the middle of the lake, and then taking long tubes and hammering them with this weight down into the bottom of the sediment 
through tens of meters of sediment sometimes. And then we pull them up, and we have this beautiful record of what happened in lakes like you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. So these are the kinds of data that we're trying to analyze now. Right. Um, those patterns, um, if we think, right, so those, that's the pattern that's in the sediment. We can try to think about the patterns that we see in the modern day as um, modern analogs for historical change. Right? So shallow, old shallow lakes should be, um, sorry, should have one, we imagine might have one set of organisms and these will change through time. So these are modern patterns. Right? And the blue coloration is the um, well-mixed lakes. The red colors are um, essentially species diversity, sorry, pat, um, a description of the types of species that are present in a lake, in stratified lakes in red. Yeah. And so it's essentially community similarity. Yeah. Um, this is what a stratified lake looks like at the edge. This is what um, a well-mixed lake looks like at the edge. And this is in terms of um, the physical environment, right? So in terms of their salinity, temperature, oxygen, light. And you can see that all, for the most part, the um, well-mixed lakes look similar to each other and physically, environmentally. And the um, stratified lakes look somewhat similar to each other. And then if you look at the organisms that include, live in those lakes, the um, well-mixed lakes have one set of organisms, the stratified lakes have a different set of organisms. And these are for the um, um, strat these are for invertebrates, but you can also find patterns um, of change with depth too. So you have more species at the surface for the most part, and fewer species at depth. Right? This is like turning a mountain upside down. Right? On mountains, you have um, most species at the bottom and fewer species on top. So it's like an inverted mountain, but not all the time. Right? So this one has most species in the middle. Why? We don't know. Right, this is something we're um, interested in trying to investigate, and we think that the secret to this might be in the sediment. Um, and if you think about the numbers of, or the abundance of different species in each lake, you essentially find a few species that are very abundant, and most species that are represented by only you know, a very, very small population. And so this is a classic pattern of um, abundance distributions for species um, on islands as well as on mainland. In terms of why are some of these species super abundant? Right. Um, let me just back up. This makes life difficult for you, doesn't it? It's all good. It's all good. Multitasking. All right. Hey, so when we're diving down here, you can see all of this on both of these, right? This is a red alga. And if you plot the distribution of that red alga, this is it in close up, um, around this lake. It forms this really thick band. It's probably about um, 20 meters wide all the way around the lake in a very specific depth. So cool. Yeah. Cool, right? And it's super abundant there, right? absolutely super abundant. If you dig, if you move it away, it looks like this underneath. It's dead coral, right? So sometime I, in the last like several decades probably, this whole ecosystem it, at the bottom of this lake changed over from being coral dominated to red alga dominated. Right? The secret for that probably is in sediment, so we're trying to, um, we're interested in investigating that. What was the depth of that? This is um, 20 meters deep okay. through about um, probably 16 meters. It's crazy. Yeah, it's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so it looks like this is, to some extent, right, maybe a new invasion or maybe just an expansion of a, an extant population. So there are lots of dynamics going on. So what happens when new species invade? In 2003, um, we, our friends in Palau basically, for the first time ever, saw this anemone in this lake. Right? It's right, um, there's one lake where a lot of tourists visit, Jellyfish Lake, you, you um, may have seen it. Um, this anemone was first seen in a small patch at the dock where the tourists get in. Okay. <laughs> so, and there are snails there that are in the ocean. There's like a coral that, at the bottom of this dock that's from the ocean. Right? These things don't normally live in the lakes. And um, we try to tell the people who look after the lakes that, hey, you know, there's this anemone. It looks like Aptasia. It could be a bad thing. And they're like, we don't want to know about it. Right? <laughs> the tourists might not, might not want to know. So, shh. <laughs> like, we think it's bad, you know, you should probably take care of it. Anyway, they didn't want to 
address it. So we basically just monitored the spread of this um, anemone over the past next um, like 10 years. So this is what it looks. So first it's just here. After um, several months, you find small populations of it on either side of this lake. And then gradually through time. And what's the scale of that? Oh, this will be about 50 meters. OK. Yeah. Um, gradually through time, it increases in abundance and distribution in this like entry channel in the lake to 2006. And then by this time, it's just um, it started to spread all around the lake. So you start to find it all around the lake. So it's a really rapid colonization. And so in, it's really abundant. This is one of the most abundant species in this lake now. Right? There's, so there's maybe something about invasive species being um, really well adapted to the conditions at that time. They spread, spread really rapidly. Um, and then this seems to be settling in um, at the moment. But you need to dis, um, separate this also from the dynamics of um, extant populations. Right? So um, this is the abundance of the jellyfish that's popular, um, that tourists go to this lake to visit through time. And so the um, really large El Nino, La Nina in 1997-98, it completed, there were no um, jellyfishes in this lake. Um, because the lake was really warm over a period of a couple of years, essentially the lake cooled, this jellyfish population came back to, at times, right, between 20 and 30 million jellyfishes in a lake. This lake is 400 meters long and 100 meters wide, right? So imagine what 20 or 30 million jellyfishes look like in that. It's, it's like soup. <laughs> Actually, it's like stew. <laughs> um, but then, like 2007, 2008, the population just crashed, died up, and it has been at a constant around 3 million, 6 million for the last um, eight years. Why? Don't know. Right? But it might have something to do with patterns of oxy oxygen um, in the water column in the lakes, or patterns of, say, temperature or salinity. We're trying to work those things out. Mm -hmm. All right. Hey, I'm going to wrap up. We, we got time. Yeah, so we do. Yeah. 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 We got plenty okay. of time. So. They say you've got time. Right. You guys say you've got time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Just check. Right. Um, and so then, if we think about what species are in the lake at the moment, right, we, might, we want to think about not only the species that have been added to the lake, but the species that have been taken away from the lake. So if we think about, um, say, these circles representing the number of species that are in a place, then this is the number of um, invertebrates that are in the ocean in Palau. And if we add up all of the invertebrates that we've collected in all of the lakes in Palau, then um, their di total diversity is this. So it's a small fraction of the diversity that's in the ocean. Right? And that's probably a colonization process to a large extent. right? So things that got from the ocean into the lakes. So it's, that's kind of the addition part of this. But as the lakes get deeper and change in um, physical structure, you can imagine that some species that are in a lake may become um, unsuited to the changing environment and so go extinct. Right. And so essentially, if you look at the diversity in these stratified lakes, these lakes that are very different in structure, you find that there are fewer species. Yeah. And so it seems that we, start, we have pulses of extinction when the lakes change in structure from um, being very well mixed to stratified. And actually during that transition, you might lose a vast majority of species and then have some additional species back in. Right? So there'd be new species from the ocean that are actually um, adapted to the new environment or pre-adapted to the new environment and then colonize in. So we're trying to work out these patterns now. Okay. It's the same for fishes. Right? Diversity in the ocean in Palau, diversity in um, the lakes in Palau, diversity in holomictic lakes, diversity in transitional lakes, diversity in myramictic lakes and red, so decreasing species diversity. And it's the same for microbes. Diversity in the ocean, diversity in the stratified lake. Right? So always generally the decreasing diversity in the lakes. And so this is then when it, um, we start to tie it into the paleoecology again. This is, um, these are data on the presence of elements um, from the surface of a sediment core to the bottom of the sediment core, right? So from, young, from the most recent sediment to the oldest sediment. So this is the bottom, the earliest lake. And you can see that there's a lot of like, change in the elements that are present. People think that these are indicative of the climate, of the physical environment through time. So this is going back in time. And you can see that at certain periods of time, there are really big changes in certain kinds of elements, suggesting there's a very big shift in the physical environment of the lakes, possibly due to um, 
a change in um, the climate at the time. Right. And so we're trying to work out, then we're going to go back through these sediments also and look at changes in fossils across these transitions and see whether we see these cha um, like losses of species at these periods and then addition of new species, mm -hmm. or, or whether we see extant species actually just change across these barriers in terms of their morphologies. If we think about um, kind of the sediments from dip, um, about six lakes, six, sorry, one, two, three, four, seven lakes that we've studied so far, and you look at um, the total so sediment record is kind of a, 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 um, an overall picture of the history, like the historical environments in lakes. You find that different lakes um, fall in, like, are, are environmentally different or have been environmentally different. But you find um, samples where they've been similar, right? And so then you can ask, well, when these lakes were environmentally similar, did they have similar complements of species historically? And these are some dates from just two lakes. And so in kind of the grays and through dark blues, we have um, different depth zones from one lake. And so these are essentially the youngest sediments and then goes oldest sediments. And then in pink are modern sediments from a different lake. And so we can see that the modern sediments from this lake are most similar to old sediments in this other lake. Yeah. And so we can maybe use, um, again, help um, look at the species that are among the lakes to understand how they relate to the physical environment and then try to see whether we can find the same kinds of communities down core uh, in um, records of old um, in other lakes. Okay, so that's kind of where we are with this study, right? We're, we've been going to Palau for um, a couple of months each of the last several years. We're going to go back there in June and we're going to try to complete these studies, collect more data on the sediments and more data on um, the species distributions in among the lakes and then over the next few years try to tie it all together. Right, so um, there'll be a lot more to this story. Um, I know, it, your next- Two years. Your Two next years. accreditation. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So this, what are the summary and prospects? This is just like the summary slide for the talk. Okay. So if we look at the literature, it's pretty clear that marine science has not contributed a huge amount at all to our understanding of patterns of development, of patterns of diversity on islands, and has not really been contributed at all to our modern conception of theory that is relevant um, to explaining diversity evolution on islands. Right? And yet, around the world, there are hundreds of these marine lakes that are physically islands, and they actually seem to act biologically like islands. Right? And that these marine lakes likely show many of the patterns of terrestrial island biota. And they suggest that we have many of the same kinds of assembly rules for communities, species diversity, and the same evolutionary patterns. Right. And one of the really nice things about this then is that you can go kind of um, say, hey, you know, we actually have something special in the marine <laughs> system that the terrestrial systems don't have. Is that these um, sediment records at the bottom of lakes don't really have an analog on most terrestrial islands. Mm -hmm. There's a much better fo like fossil and subfossil record in, in the lakes than there is on terrestrial islands. So this may be actually some, um, something that we can contribute that's absolutely novel um, to island theory because we have that record. So this would be interesting. So this is the work we're doing. Marine lakes are virtually unknown. They're super fantastic places to go work. <laughs> right? They're fan beautiful destinations. And um, this is um, one of the um, great benefits of being essentially a biologist right, and a researcher. <laughs> and, um, not only having the privilege to come and speak to people like you, right, but also to work in these fantastic places. So that's the talk. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Hey. Right on.